Amen. Let's continue standing as we read from Philippians chapter 2. We're going to begin in the 12th verse. Philippians 2, beginning in the 12th verse. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. This is a reading from God's Word. Please be seated. And let us bow for just a prayer of illumination so we can ask the Lord to open up our hearts and eyes. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for the, the preservation of your Word. For, Lord, we could read your Word today in Gastonia in the year 2020. Lord, I pray that as, you, as we have read your word and as we expound on your word, that uh, you would enable us to see our same spirit given to us as that of the Philippian church. That we continue to strive together to make the gospel known, Lord. And I also pray, Lord, that you would enable us to look at ourselves for a moment and see if we are what we claim to be. Because, Lord, you do work in your people, both to will and to work for your good pleasure. Enable us, Lord, to see if we are that people. It's in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. We've been going over the book of Philippians now for several weeks. And what, what is interesting about the book of Philippians is uh, it's talking about a church in which the apostle says, I have assurance of your salvation. And that's important because if we look at the true marks of a church, you know, a, a church that's faithful to the Word of God, a church that commits not just in word, Jesus is Lord, but submits to every single word our King has established for His body, the church. Uh, it, it, it would bring us comfort to know we are, but yet, when we consider the state of our nation, the situation in our world, it brings up a lot of questions. A lot of questions that when you hit the streets, and you ask specific questions, like for instance, what's happening in this world? What do you think is the remedy for this world? Good question, right? The world needs help. What's the remedy? And after I get a, a, a long discussion on uh, the power that protesters have, this is what I do here, the power that protesters have, the power that the United States gives us to voice our opinion, if we make ourselves known, if we, now notice, if we make ourselves known, we will get this world to change. All we need to do is love. And what I notice in that, in that conversation is if we make ourselves known. Consider that. Who are we? Who are we to make ourselves known? We're nobody. As a matter of fact, the only reason why anyone is somebody is because God called you out of this world to make you someone, to make you a disciple of His. So as I listen and then ask the question, which I think is the, uh, 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 an important question is, well, what's your consideration of the church? 
the Church of Jesus Christ. And the responses I do get are hatred, anger, frustration. I hear the terms hypocrites, uh, fake, um, the book isn't real. These are the things I'm hearing. And as I'm hearing these, and I see the tone of the voice, I see the anger. It's almost looking like your book says something more than what I see coming from you. And of course there, my heart starts to wrestle. And I say, Lord, what has the church done to you? What have we done to him? <laughs> and that puts a lot of weight on us because if we are supposed to be who we are, it glorifies God the Father because they're able to see. So now I do a little reflection. And I think about how in Jesus' ministry, right, he first calls out 12. He calls out 72, and he's continually sending them out, telling them to trust me and go out and tell them about why I came. And in the process, Europe gets transformed. It's amazing, right? Europe gets transformed. So I go back and I'm praying and I'm saying, okay, Lord, we're not transforming anything. We can't even live up to what you say in the church. What are we doing wrong? Well, to get to the basics, we're reading a letter, and it's to the Philippians, right? And like a letter, it's written, as Paul said, to all the saints that are in Christ Jesus. That means, in verse 1, that you are set apart to be in Christ so, which means that this letter could possibly get into the hands of people who think <laughs> they're in Christ, right? It's possible. And what I notice is when you go to a Christian bookstore, there's what Philippians is known for four classic verses that I call the coffee cup verses. That everybody and their mom and their uncle and uh, just claims. They put it on their coffee cup. It's verses like this. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ. And that's on the coffee cup, and we take our Facebook pictures and we show that. The second one is, for God is working in me both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And that's another one of those coffee cup standards. The next one is, and this is mostly just the Reformed people that say this, I want to be found in Him, not having a righteousness that's my own, that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Then you have the classic one, which is the one that's the most quoted in all, out of all Philippians. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And those are all beautiful verses. They, are, they do look nice on a coffee cup. But the question is, do we own the right to claim those verses? That's a bold question. Especially when, you know what, every generation of the church has been influenced by the philosophy of the age. Every church. Whether it was the 1st century, the 5th century, the 8th century, the 12th century, all the way on. Today in our church, the, the, the philosophy of the day is relativism and pluralism. We've softened everything so much that all we want to make a person a bona fide Christian is you believe in Jesus Christ. And that's it. And the church has forgotten something. You and I can't make a Christian. Neither can you make yourself a Christian or me induce you by words of wisdom that, that I may have in order to make you a Christian. Now, I didn't make that up. John said that. In, in John chapter 1, verse 13, it's that verse that no one goes to, they stop at 12. For as many as received unto them, he gave the right to become children of God. 
We all know that one, but the very next line is, who were born not of man, nor the will of man, but of God. See, God has to do a work. So now when we take this letter, because we want to really discern who are the, re the rightful recipients of this letter to the Philippians. Let's look at what uh, we read this morning on Philippians chapter 12, uh, chapter 2, verse 12. Because what we want to do is we want to look at the text and get our understanding right from the text itself. Paul says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So the first thing Paul says is, notice, he said, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. Now, what is it that Paul is saying that they have always obeyed? Now, it's important because we could put anything we want to put in there. But the key is, we want to confine ourselves to this letter. Now, think about this. Imagine if you worked for an employer, and you worked for him for 30 years. And he sent out a general letter to all his employees. And at the end of 30 years, he closed the business. He was going to give people their due reward. But then some didn't get it. But they all read the letter and it says, well, I thought I was included. You know, I trusted you. I asked you things and you always gave me the answer. You always saw to my needs. You were always fair to me. But yet this employer says, but there was something lacking in the people that I appointed into my business always sought my interests before their own. You came into my employment and you only sought your own interests. A matter of fact, whenever there was a meeting or we had to get involved in something, you decided to save your skin and avoid it. So you have no inheritance in this business. And that's important because when the church is being called in our society ineffective, the blame has to be here because this part here isn't challenging people and teaching you to observe everything Jesus commanded us. So that's the first part. The second part is you in the church. Whether we're here, whether we're down, wherever we are, it's you. And how do we know? There's one employer. Now we may subdivide in a thousand committees and make a lot of chiefs. But if that chief isn't pointing to what Christ said, that chief is dead. Think about it. Because Paul warned us in Acts chapter 20. And he warned us and he was crying vehemently. Why was he crying? Because he knows the deceptiveness of people who work for the evil. Well, what do they do? He said, from among yourselves will rise up people who will seek followers after them. That's crucial. So when we look at this text, he says, Therefore, my beloved, and Paul calls him my beloved. And there's a reason why he calls him my beloved. Um, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but also, what did they obey? Let's take a look. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. I can understand why he calls him beloved. Because he first thanks God for all the remembrance of these people. He says, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with what? Joy. So you see how Paul could say, look, you're my beloved. <laughs> you, always, you, you obey. I could pray with joy. But why could I pray with joy? What makes me say I could pray with joy? Because the next line he says, because of. Here it is. Because of your partnership in the gospel. From the very first day until now. He says, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, when he was first amongst the Philippians, but much more in my absence. See, and he says, because of your partnership in the gospel. So there's first that we notice that these believers partnered with the gospel. So imagine having a church meeting. 
just like they did. I, I, I'm picturing this. This is, a, this is a good one, right? Where all of a sudden everybody's saying, okay, we got to get this gospel out to our neighborhoods. We got to get this message. Let's use every means possible, but we want them to hear the gospel, right? That's what they did. That's how Europe got conquered. The enemy, no. The enemy usually puts you in. There's an Italian characteristic of cement shoes. And cement shoes is they would put them on a person they didn't particularly like. <laughs> they would throw them in the water and he would sink. I call those the ones that just <laughs> slow you up enough. But consider every day someone dies not knowing who Jesus Christ is. So he says, these people partnered with them. Whatever it took, they brought that gospel out. You see, they brought that gospel out. Then he says, I am sure of this. Now, here's the key, and this is what we are to always look for, because when we see this challenge in our world, you got to say this, just because a mouse goes in a cookie jar does not make the mouse a cookie. <laughs> Logical, right? Just because a person walks into church and parts their hair on the side and wears a suit and a tie doesn't necessarily mean they've been put there by God's grace. We can sing amazing grace and be moved all day long, but you may never have been touched by it. How do we know? Because Paul says, right after that, he says, because of your partnership with God, from the first day until now, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you. So the one who started that good work in them, that made them partner in the gospel, he's the one that will bring it to completion. Pretty clear. God made the Philippian believer. Then he says, It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. Again, he could call them beloved because beloved is a term that comes from the heart. And Paul is speaking his heart here. He says, It's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. Why? Why? For you are all partakers with me of grace. So not only does he see God's work in him, in them, because of their partnership with the gospel, but he also sees that they're partakers of grace. This is the grace that sustains those whom will be persecuted for their allegiance and proclamation of Christ. He says, because the partakers of me of grace, both in both both is very key word, in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. So here's another key ingredient. They both confirmed the gospel and defended the gospel, which brings us back to what Peter says in his letter, always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks for the hope that's in you. See, that, that's a confirmation. So what we see uttered on those who are truly born again, there's not, there, Christ is the only person. See, like Paul, you know, we're gonna, we're, our lives will be this way. Man, I am tossed between two spheres, whether to be here with you or to be with the Lord. It's far better for me to be with the Lord, but you know what? Because I love you so much, I'm going to stay here with you so that Christ will be made known. So the first key we see is, here's the people sold out for, for people being Christ, what? Centered and gospel-driven. Very important. He continues, he says, um, since they're both in his imprisonment and defense, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, now Paul's in prison, he's writing this letter, and what's typical about those who don't listen to Jesus, because Jesus always says something which qualifies our salvation. It, qual it shows we have been saved by his grace. He says this, if you desire to save your life, you're going to lose it. Those are strong words, but it came from the one who gave his life for us. He gave his life for us. So he says, if you decide to save your life, you will lose it. And there's ways to do that. Play the game, but don't say the name. We do that. We do that very well. But the world has 2020 vision in the year 2020, where God is trying to show us 2020 that the world needs born again Christians again to bring forth that message in order to make the people see straight. I like the fact that he picked 2020. I haven't had 2020 in a few years, but thanks be to God, he's given me a different 2020, and I hope for all of you. 
we're going to get hurt. Of course we are. We're going to get persecuted. That's why he says, don't be anxious about things. <laughs> but in prayer and supplication, I'm going to take care of you. But he says this, when he went to jail, these people didn't hide. He said, it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So instead of hiding, they became more bold. They know what the outcome is. They're going to prison. But they became more bold. It's just like the believers who were made disciples. And what do they do in Acts chapter 8? Saul comes in, ravishes their houses, throw them out, puts people in jail. They run. But what do they do when they run? They brought forth the gospel to every place they were scattered. Some traveled three to four hundred miles, and in between they were given the gospel, not fearing their lives because they had faith in Jesus Christ's words. Don't fear man who could destroy the body. But fear him and he who could destroy you both in, he in hell. Now think about that. You know who he's talking to? Disciples. Because there's a part of our salvation that shows forth we have been bought by God. In Philippians 2.12, where we read, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, what is this fear and trembling that we're to work out? Well, first thing is, that we want to consider is this. If God saves us, since he has saved some, and since Jesus says, how, when the disciples ask him, how many, Lord, will be saved? He said, just a few, which is tough words because we want to make that few as broad as we possibly can. What is some of the criteria that shows forth that we're working out something? And then we're going to find out who worked it in us in order to work that out, you see? But he, the first thing we want to do is, there's a word that the Holy Spirit uses in Scripture. It's a word called homologeo. Big word, but it just means confess, profess, speak, you know, say something. And what we hear repeatedly in Scripture is this, in Romans 10. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. So the first thing we see is there's a word in the, the saints' hearts in Rome. It's in their mouth and it's in their heart. Someone put it in their heart. He says, that is the word of faith, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. So there's a confession that goes out of your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Now, sadly, the evangelical church just takes that as, just say that and you're saved. <laughs> Taking it completely out of context. Basically what it would be is, we are to go before Nero and Caligula, the Roman emperor, and say, you're not God. Jesus Christ is. And I assure you, heaven's doors will be open for you because you'll be ushered into the kingdom of heaven real quick. And that's not bad news. Then he says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, Paul is giving us a commentary on Jesus' words, like all the epistles do. He said, for with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth... One confesses and is saved. The remedy for the world is not Christmas shoeboxes. We can hide in our catacombs and make those all day long and get positive verses out. It's going out and confess. You can't be cowards about it. We have to confess. Jesus said, Everyone who acknowledges me before men. Now, when you hear the word everyone, does it exclude certain people? It does it, right? And I want us, Lord, I just pray that we could hear your words. <laughs> Everyone who acknowledges me before men, 
I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Jesus said again, and I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will acknowledge you before the angels of God. John chapter 9, verse 22. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed, and this is what the Jews agreed with, that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. So again, you have that verbal talk that if anyone confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, put him out. John interprets that for us. Not the preacher. <laughs> John interprets it. He says, by this you know the Spirit of God. Here's how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses again speaks that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. That is the spirit of Antichrist. That is the spirit of Antichrist. Now, remember what Paul says, from amongst our own selves. I, I am convinced that Satan is the most kindest, lovable person you'd ever want to encounter. I mean, we picture him with horns and an ugly-looking face, you know what I mean? But no, 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 no. If he's going to deceive you, he's going to look, smell like a sheep. He's going to be kind because the world wants to see kindness and love, right? And we can be so easily, that's why God has made it clear, listen, if they're on Team Jesus, they're going to talk about me, who I am, right? They're not going to be afraid. Then he says, this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, now is in the world already. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in you. Do you hear that? Whoever confesses, and don't fear, this is what our task is, whoever confesses that Jesus, God abides in him and he in God. So how do I know God is in you? Consider those. Now, let's start look at verse 13. For it is God who works in you. You see that? For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Here's where, here's where we could see the identity of those who have been born from above and those who have made themselves. Those who have made themselves Christians aren't putting Christ first. All you got to do is, how do you do it? You'd have a meeting like Philippian church, right? Let's get this gospel out. Everybody would be on fire to just tell people about the life, death, and resurrection. It's not how articulate we say it. It's not. We don't have to have a, a, a seminarian degree in order to present the gospel. He picked 11 fishermen, and one was a scholar. And you know what that scholar said? He said this, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come to you proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing, there goes the lofty speech of wisdom, to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Wait a minute. Paul was in fear, trembling. Paul didn't have stage fright. <laughs> Paul was the least one afraid of being able to speak to thousands of people. So it was his stage. You know what he was? He was fearing and trembling because God was working in this person in order to make him bold for the gospel. That's evidence Jesus Christ is in you. Do you see that? Do you see that? I mean, that's important because that's the key. And then he finishes up. He says, I was with you in weakness, fear, with much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. See, Paul knew something that we forgot. For the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. You want the world to really see 
the power behind the church. That same power that rose Jesus from the grave, if it lives in you, if he lives in you, you could do nothing other than what he did, right? Nothing other than what he did. We look at these. Okay, God works in us both to will and to do, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. How does that happen? Here's what God says, and I'm going to show you how it has an effect on the churchite. I use that word, it's a churchite. First off, there's a new covenant blessing. What does God promise? In Ezekiel 36, he says, I will give you a new heart, first and foremost. I'm going to put a new spirit within you. And I will remove that heart of stone from your flesh, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey all my rules. Look what God does for his people. That's amazing. He, why does he do it? Because we can't. We can't. So he says, I will put my spirit. Now, the key is, if we're going to take the letter of Philippians and take all those coffee cup verses and swallow them that they're ours, do you have the same spirit as they? Consider that. Because if you see your life is nowhere like them, you have yet to be born from above. That's serious. That means all your pleading, all your, all your doing, whatever you're doing, is nothing. Because without faith, you can't please God to begin with. See, this is an important part. But the key is, when you come, when we're coming to church, whose voice do we hear? It's not supposed to be mine. I'm, I'm only as good as what I say he said and point to him. And our elders are only as good as they point to him. And you are only as good if you point to him and encourage to go out to do these things. You do the body no good but give us a bad look in the church and amongst the world when we do not. Jesus said this. Jesus is walking in Galilee. He said, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. <laughs> you know what I love about this? You know you had to be taught by God and all who have been taught by God will come to Jesus because all Jesus said was, he's walking he sees a couple of the brothers over there fish. He says, follow me. And what does the very next line say? Immediately. Only God could do that. See, a lot of us come to church so we can feel good about ourselves. A lot of us come to church so we can have a moral look and everybody says, oh, they're church going family. They're good people. You see? And again, it points to us. You're only as good as you follow Jesus Christ, you see? And he says he immediately left their nets and followed him. Jesus said again, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And Luke, James, John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon, Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on you'll be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. Now, some might say, well, Jesus said more things there. He must have given a long story about who he was. If he did, the Holy Spirit would have made sure he didn't repeat it three times. He said two words, follow me. And when a person follows Jesus, what does he say a disciple does? He makes you fishers of human beings. Now, I know there's some who are of the stoic persuasion in the church. Those are the ones that have so much starch in their clothes they can't bend over to tie their shoes because it's just too stiff. <laughs> there's a lot of them. You could tell they had the face of Caiaphas. <laughs> you know, it's just, mm. no, that's not for us, it's for them. Well, then the Philippian church was wrong. The people in Acts were wrong. And when Jesus says to go into all the world, 
Man, we don't have the luxury of jumbo jets back then that could take him all over the world. It's meant to be. And of course, he's going to give power to his disciples. So you see how that works. Uh, so when we see that, the only way you will, and the only way you'll know a person is a Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ, is because what? They follow Jesus Christ. They talk Jesus Christ, and their number one concern is the real love. That person across the street is dying without knowing Jesus Christ. If I really love my neighbor, because God says, I'm going to cause you to walk in my ways, I'm going to tell them the only hope in the world. It's not me. It's not my protesting. It's not my argumentation. It's not what political party I'm involved in. It's Jesus Christ and him alone. Amen? It's only him. Jesus said to us, he says, you're not greater than me. There's a conditional clause, I will say it. In 1 Peter, he says, if you have been called, you've been called because Christ suffered for you, he left you an example so that you might follow in his, in his steps. You see, when Jesus says something, he warns us. In today's church growth, they're worried about numbers. They want numbers because they want to have that bragging right. Then they build these big mausoleums. I call them mausoleums because they're only harvesting the dead. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but they build these big mausoleums and come and listen to me. And you got the most dynamic preacher up there giving you a bill of goods, but not accountable to anybody. That's why I'm a concerted Presbyterian. Because why? We're accountable to what we say, which is good. But you have this rise of independency. What's going on, folks? Jesus built the church with his people by saying, you are not greater than me. I suffered. You better count the cost. That's Jesus. Count the cost. It's going to cost you your life. It's going to cost you your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your house, your lands, everything for my sake. Human being, you can't do that. If God don't work in you, it's not going to happen. And to appease our conscience, we will get calluses where we sit in our favorite church seat. And that's the best of it, where we should have them on our feet. And we should get dry mouth from preaching that word. Paul says in Romans, if you're children, if you're children of God, then you're heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. You'll inherit with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. How does that happen? How? He says this in 2 Thessalonians, Therefore, we ourselves boast about you, those in Thessalonica. What does he boast about them for? You in the churches of God, and I'm telling every one of the churches of God, for your steadfastness and your faith in all your persecutions and afflictions that you're enduring. So now we see another church, the church in Thessalonica. He's saying, you're enduring what you were called to go through, suffering. Folks, the moment you suffer, whether it's slander or anything, for Christ, you're going to feel something in your body that you've never, ever felt before. His presence in such a demonstrable power of His Spirit that will make you go on fire to tell more people. Because when we don't do that, the only thing that moves us maybe is a song that just has enough inspiration to it to make us feel good, but then it fades out the minute we hit the heat outside, right? Who are these people in Thessalonica that had to endure the afflictions? He says this in 2 Thessalonians 2.13. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you. Notice who chose who. God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. Here's the identity. Through the setting apart of the Spirit, remember what God's promise was? I will put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my ways. And belief in the truth. To this He called you through our gospel so that you may obtain, you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm. Hold to the traditions that you were taught. I stop there. How many of us could go into a church and all of a sudden the traditions become God's word of what that church holds to than, uh, than what God's word says? We see it in every church. Some are more subtle. Here's how we do it. Here's the way we are. Accept us the way we are. And don't bring what? Discord in us because this is the way we are. So what tradition are we to follow? He says this. 
To this he called you through our gospels that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm, hold to the traditions that you were taught by us. Ah, so who do we go to? We go right back to Scripture alone. We go right back to the source, Scripture alone. And in closing, as we look at the rest of the verses in, in this context, he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. It's easy to grumble and dispute when you say, wow, I'm getting beaten up. I lost this. I lost that. Uh, or disputing, well, well, you're not suffering enough as I do. See, there's a little argument going on there. But he says, look, don't do these things with grumbling and disputing. Here's what he wants you to do. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst. Now, I want you to show you how the world hasn't changed of a crooked and twisted generation. 54 AD, 2020 AD. Has our world changed? They're in the same predicament we are. The only difference is we have technology. <laughs> but we're in the same thing. But he says this, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Wow. So Paul again is going back to what Jesus said about those who follow him. Because he says, you, in this perverse and crooked generation, shine as lights. And what is he saying? Jesus said this, you are the light of the world. We're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. I think we've done that. I think we took the lamp and put it under here because we, we don't want you no know, issues, right? He said, but we put it on a stand. We put it on a stand and it gives light to all. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to God the Father. How does that happen? <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all the spiritual blessings in Christ, just as he has predestined me. See that whole idea of God choosing a people out for himself. We got to know who they look like. We have to. That's our task, to know who they look like. Because the very next line says, they hold fast to the word of life. See what the Philippian church does? He wants it to be without blemish in the midst of this crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights of the world, holding fast to the word of life, holding forth the word of life. The word of life is the gospel. The gospel gives life. So he says they're holding forth the word of life. It carries the missional idea since believers in the previous line are called light. That means believers are constantly proclaiming their maker and redeemer to a world lost in sin. Hold things fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. And I can understand Paul saying that because there is a running in vain and a laboring in vain to try to wake up those right wherever we are to follow Jesus Christ and this past weekend I this past week I had talked to several church planters some were um, of the Baptist persuasion and others are ready to split from the Presbyterian Church of America over issues of they're not getting the gospel out which is a good issue to split it really is. And in that, we had a, a dialogue. And I was asked the question, what is the hardest thing you endure through your 33 years of walking with Christ? I said, the hardest thing to endure is people who claim the name but show no evidence that God actually called them. I cry more for them because it will come a time in their life when they'll say, Lord, Lord, did I not do this? Did I not do that? And Jesus says these words, I never knew you. I understand what Jesus meant when he says, Father, I don't pray for the world. I only pray for the ones you gave me. 
And then he prays for everyone whom the Father gives him. And I pray that you bear fruit and your fruit will remain. And you know what fruit that is? <laughs> Look at the fruit that Paul is giving us this morning. He is in the kingdom of heaven rejoicing. <laughs> if God has given us the ears and the heart and we respond, his fruit is still remaining. Amen.